Lombard said that having two Catholics in a row is to keep you awake before lunch. I'm not sure what having a Reformed guy uh, show up late in the, in the morning during this time may be uh, hopefully not an intellectual ambient for you. Um, uh, what I would like to do is look at this broad topic of a reform notion of the state, um, recognize this is, a, this is a huge topic and there are many different expressions to how it can be understood. Um, myself, uh, I was drawn to this question um, early in life, right out of college, uh, as many of you are. Um, I came to Washington, D.C. with a desire to write and to be involved in the political discussions of our day. and. Uh, fell into communications because, of course, they paid better than journalism um, and uh, was involved in, in a, a, a contentious time in politics. This is mid to late 90s Washington, D.C. It was an interesting time to kind of cut my teeth as a Reformed Christian in the Washington, D.C. area. And, and, and that began a trajectory that um, has now led me to uh, Reformed Theological Seminary where I teach Old Testament. Um, for many people, that, is, that means that I teach esoterica, uh, I teach irrelevance, some people might even say. Um, however, I do think it's relevant. And that interest in what it means to be a Christian, particularly a Reformed Christian, who thinks highly of Scripture, as Tom Farr just mentioned, um, how do you think about the state? And uh, this led me to begin at our uh, campus, the Institute of Theology and Public Life, where we're really looking at how do we connect the, the, the powerful app of systematic theology, of reform theology, to the public square, not so much staying in that abstract space of theorization and not ending up with your know, voting guides and policy prescriptions, but rather what are the ideas that inform what we do. And so I would like to talk just for about you know, 20 minutes or so about some of the key themes I think we need to think about. If you're, if you're coming out of a reform mindset, and even if you're not, because you might say, wait a minute, this actually helps in how I'm doing, the work that I'm, I'm up to. We like to share uh, our theology and the contributions that it has. And of course, a lot of these contributions are going to overlap with other traditions in Christendom. Um, I'd like to start with this idea of what is theology. Uh, one of our professors at Reform Theological Seminary, John Frame, argues that theology is the application of scripture, okay, so start with that, application of scripture by individual persons, okay, interestingly, now we're talking about sort of a subjective aspect, you've got the scripture, you've now got the subjective aspect of the person doing the application into situations in life, in other words, into particular aspects, moments in history, time, and place that are inhabited by, and I'm adding this last part, inhabited by finite creatures. And that's important, because I think as we look at church history, and we look at how people have applied their traditions into the idea of the state, we have to recognize that they don't know everything that we know now, and there are things that they knew that we don't know now, because in part, we are all finite individuals, right? So as a, as a Calvinist, I can say, drawing off of the tradition of Calvin, I can also say that I disagree with Calvin in some points, because like Calvin, I see my historical predecessors as being provisional, right? That's actually what Calvin wrote about the councils in the Reformation. Following the Reformation, when they were throwing out everything that the councils had done, Calvin said, whoa, wait, wait a minute, don't throw it all out. It's provisional. Test it. Check it against Scripture. And so that's what I would do with Calvin as well, and with Third Knox, and, and you name it, Abraham Kuyper, whoever we're going to, out of my tradition. So let me start with a couple of themes, some biblical theological themes that I think help us better understand how we should think about or approach the state from a biblical point of view. So I'd like to start with a topic that I think most of us would begin with. Um, this is true both of Catholic and Reformed thought. And it's this idea of divine kingship. Okay? Of course, the Reformed tradition makes much of divine kingship. You hear it in the phrase sovereignty. But this idea that God's authority over the heavens and the earth is without caveat, it's without exception, it's without, uh, there's no kind of secondary idea. This is based in the old Christian uh, Trinitarian doctrine of aseity, the idea that God is simple, that he's whole and complete and non-contingent, and he's the only thing that is, right? Everything else is contingent, including the state, including the universe, including us, ourselves. God himself, however, is not. He is divine king. 
The psalmist says, The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. Okay? You notice that lack of caveat? It's not, it's not Israel is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. It's not the church is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. Where those who follow God are the Lord's in the fullness thereof. It's the whole earth. It's the whole cosmos because God is king. He owns the world. It's his. This is why Jesus can say, as Jesus is taking the authority that's been given to him by the Father, he can say, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. Right? Notice he doesn't just say it's the authority of the church. He doesn't just say it's the authority of my people or wherever the gospel is proclaimed or something like that. All authority in heaven and earth is mine. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, J.I. Packer, who some of you know, uh, Anglican theologian, points out, this is the foundation for the Great Commission. So as we go out and proclaim the faith as Christians, we do so on the foundation that God already owns and has all authority and has given it to Christ Jesus. So this idea that even human authorities like the state, even an atheistic state, right, even, even a, a state that deliberately rejects the triune God, still derives its authority from the Lord, from divine kingship. When Paul writes in Romans 13 that the Lord has given Caesar the sword, the power of the sword, you know he's talking about a young Nero. Okay? He, he's not talking about a Christian, you know, a Christian administration. He's talking about Nero. Now this is before Nero goes nuts, but it's still Nero nonetheless. And he says he's given him the power of the sword. So Nero gets his authority from God and will be held responsible by God for what he does with his authority. You see this in the Old Testament. And the prophets who talk about the fact that the nations will be judged by God. There are oracles against the nations in every one of the prophetic books. And Isaiah has them in Isaiah 14 through 23. They close out Jeremiah in the Hebrew Bible. They're in the middle of the Septuagint Bible version of Jeremiah. Ezekiel has them in the middle. Uh, the 12 minor prophets have them in the middle. Think about Nahum, Jonah. This is for me, biblical nerds who want to know where this comes from. Notice the prophets aren't just talking to Israel. They care about the world. And the world will be held responsible according to the divine authority. Now there's an extension in that. Okay, There's an extension from the divine kingship to my second point. And that's this idea of all humans. Tom Farr brought this up. All humans being made in the image of God. Now, I don't think we can understand the image of God apart from this idea of divine kingship. We need to know how God reigns. And what does God do as king? He builds his palace. He builds his sanctuary, as it were, and that is the earth and the heavens for that matter. And he is about the work of completing that sanctuary. He's about the work of completing that palace. The, the, the account of Genesis 1 has us begin with this kind of chaotic state, tohu vabohu, right, where life cannot thrive. It can't, to use modern um, you know, political terms, you hear a lot, flourish. Life can't flourish in it. And what does he do? He draws up out of the chaos for separating the waters and bringing the land out of the waters. He's creating the spheres. You have light and dark, waters above, waters below. You have earth and waters. And then what does he do? He then fills those things. He puts the sun and the moon in the sky. And then he puts, the, as a word, this is interesting, uh, ancient Near Eastern zoology, he puts the fish in the waters. Okay, this is day five. And he puts the fish in the waters above, those are the birds. Okay, you know that in, in, in biblical zo you know, zoological classification, fish and birds are going to be in the same group because they dwell in the waters. Okay, and then he has on earth, he puts all of the uh, creatures of the earth on it on day six. Okay, he's created this place that was formless and void now has form and has substance. And then what does he do? He creates man and woman in his image, and he says, go out, fill the earth, and subdue it. We should be thinking about what the Lord has just done by filling the earth and subduing it, and then making humanity in his image to then go and do that too. He's fundamentally saying, you are kings derived from me. Go out, fill the earth, and so do it. Notice they have a trajectory too. They have a teleology or an eschatology. They are supposed to, this whole program is supposed to end with the earth being formed and filled with images of God reflecting back his glory. Now in, in Christian tradition we call it the cultural mandate. This idea that we are all kind of deeply down in our very essence image of God 
And therefore, we reflect him in a variety of ways, whether that's reason, linguistics, um, aesthetics, you name it, being human means being image of God. And even after the fall, that judgment that we are image of God, that judgment is not rescinded. So it's even true for the unbeliever as for the believer. We all bear that dignity and that kind of inner desire for flourishing, though now it is hindered, right? And hence, we come into this need for the state in our modern day, in this discussion. We are now hindered and under the curse of sin, and so we require the state to maintain order. We require the state to continue this work of flourishing, of filling the earth and subduing it. It's interesting, too, I would actually argue that for Christians uh, following the Great Commission, what are we called to do? To go out and proclaim the gospel, creating new images, redeemed images of God, and discipling the nation. So even the Great Commission is, is sort of sprouting out of this idea of cultural mandate. It's not a, it's not a new cultural mandate. It's an extension of it. Okay? You are to go out and form the earth and subdue it through the proclamation of the gospel. But when I come to any state, whether that's the Chinese state, whether that's um, you know, uh, the state in, in, in Syria right now under, uh, under duress, when I come to it, I recognize that they are made in the image of God. It bears dignity, all the humans over which they're reigning. And I want to think, then, how do I help them? Or how, how can they be aided in that effort of, of forming and filling the earth? I'd actually add that you asked a very good question about the church and the persecution in China. Um, I was in China last October, right as the first wave of persecution was beginning uh, against the early rain church. As a matter of fact, I was teaching class. It just so happens, as I was leaving you know, out of Detroit okay, to fly over the, over the, 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 the globe and come down um, into Shanghai, and I caught these last news reports even before the internet was lost of this happening, and interestingly, when I landed, the, the class that I was teaching, many of whom were connected to this church, um, didn't know about it, and it was only over the course of the week you could see the rumors coming in as people were becoming aware of what was happening to their brothers and sisters. I would say there, there is this common belief, and, and it's not entirely wrong, but that persecution helps the church. I think historically speaking, persecution does help the church in short term. Um, but all we need to do is look at North Africa and see how long-term persecution, this is the sad side of it, right? Long-term persecution can really lead to a strong diminishment of the church. We're only seeing now, actually, the church in North, North Africa um, come back after almost a millennia and a half of being almost completely dark. And remember, North Africa is you know, sort of the heart of early Christendom, okay? So we, we need to be reminded, well, God in his wonderful providence and glory blesses those who are united with the sufferings of Christ. And so I often tell my students there, I say, I'm going to teach you theology, you're going to teach me how to be united with the sufferings of Christ as a Christian. Because I don't know how to do that coming out of my context. And, uh, and we can learn much from them. And yet also remember, it should never lead us then to sort of be passive in the face of persecution. So, we are all made in the image of God, and this has bearing on our view of the state, because the state is not operating outside of divine kingship. It's not operating outside of divine sovereignty. It actually derives its authority from God, and it is ruling over image bearers of God, who are likewise based in this notion of forming and filling the earth, of bringing order to the earth. Another reason why I was interested in the state was for a kind of practical purpose in uh, 2003, my father, who had served for 32 years in the Navy, uh, was called back and, and uh, actually stood up the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, located right outside of uh, Washington here in McLean. Actually, it was a sludged area in McLean. Um, <clears throat> but if, there's certain parts of McLean, you know, where you turn, you make the wrong turn, and suddenly you realize you're not in, you're not, not in the Safeway parking lot. Okay. Um, and he had to ask this question as, as an elder in a Presbyterian church, as he was. You know, how do I think about this job of counterterrorism? And what is terrorism? Terrorism is at its core. It's not the effort to kill the most amount of people. It's not an effort even to win a war. It's an effort to sow anarchy and fear and confusion. 
right? It is to push back against that order and that flourishing that all humans decide. That's the power of terrorism. You know? And in a way, that, 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 that just kind of gets a very distilled notion of the state, this idea of turning back those who would sow anarchy, chaos, and death. Isn't that what the state is for? The Reformed tradition also brings, so we talk about divine kingship, we talk about the image of God as being derived out of that. The Reformed tradition also brings a strong view of continuity between the Old and the New Testament. This is why I, as an Old Testament scholar, um, have a lot of interest in how we think about the state, because of course, the Old Testament talks about the state quite a bit. There's a high view in the Reformed tradition of what to do with Israel. We do read the Old Testament. We don't think it's esoterica or irrelevant. We wonder, what does Israel mean for us today? And yet, how do we understand that in light of the work of Jesus Christ? Okay? I'm not receiving the law from Moses and sort of directly applying it into a situation around me today. For instance, I'm not looking at how Moses handles um, you know, treating the Canaanites and the Levant during the period of the Karambayan. Okay? That's a very unique, very particular situation. It's a fascinating discussion, and we don't have time to go into it. But um, I'm not going to take that and apply that directly into modern-day politics, right? I'm going to actually follow what Christ himself does when Christ is applying the Old Testament into the New. And he's often taking the teachings of Israel, and he's highlighting the sort of moral aspects that, of course, still maintain for all of humanity. Okay, from murder, for instance, right? Murder is a, the, the, the mandate against murder in the Old Testament, we would say, gives us a strong foundation to stand upon. Not merely for the church. It's not just that the church isn't supposed to murder, right? This is for all of humanity. And yet, there are these other civil laws, and in the Reformed tradition, we've made this distinction between the moral law, the ceremonial law having to do with the temple that's fulfilled in Christ, and then finally the civil law as having this kind of different administration in this new. Um, ecclesia, and that just means congregation, translating the Hebrew word kahal, which means congregation. This new congregation that Christ has uh, inaugurated. Right? What does that mean for us today? Now it's interesting, Paul will do things like take rules about sexual immorality that were capital offenses in Old Testament Israel, and then he'll say in 1 Corinthians 5, that now gets applied into our day and age through excommunication from the church. Now notice, he's not saying the church has now replaced Israel. He's not arguing that, but he's saying, how do I understand the Old Testament that is written for me, that Jesus says cannot be canceled out, is not abdicated in my reign, must be fulfilled. Well, it finds its fulfillment in Christian ethics, particularly in their application in the church. Okay. So that has to be kind of brought into our discussion of the state. We have a high view of the Old Testament in the continuity of redemptive history. It's not two stories of redemption, it's one story of redemption. Okay, when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's making an audacious claim. There's reasons why certain people would pick up stones, right? He's making some audacious claims about himself and his relationship to the Father. So when we talk about the state, we can talk about what's said in the Reformed tradition to be the second use of the law. That is, the use of the law to constrain evil. Romans 13 talks about this, the, the, the power of the sword that's given to Caesar to constrain evil, to push back against oppression, against chaos and death. Now with that said, we don't want to ignore the civil law of the Old Testament either. So we see for instance that um, you know, there are rules about what to do if you have an ox who's known for gory. Okay? Right? This isn't really common to us, but we might say, what do you do if you have a car that's known for having its wheels fly off when it's driving at high speeds, okay? If you have that car and you don't get it fixed and your wheels fly off and you kill someone, that might be negligent homicide, right? If you have an ox who's known to bore people and then it bores someone because you don't have them behind the fence, that, is, that makes you, have, you know, under a greater culpability than if the ox wasn't known for boring, in which case it might just merely be unintentional or something along those lines. Okay, we, can, we can draw from the Old Testament law principles for applying uh, uh, theology to the issue of the state. I would point out how in Deuteronomy 20, Israel is told it's not a bad thing for you to expand your, your borders. You can expand beyond the promises up to Abraham, you know, the, the, the borders in uh, the, the river in Egypt and the, and the Euphrates in the north as the two borders of the land that are given to Abraham. 
And yet the Lord says, you can expand out. But if you do that, always sue for peace. And you only go to war if the nation is an aggressor. Right? So even here, in the Old Testament, we have these kind of foundations for what will become just war theory. Okay? So we can take some of these principial foundations and apply them into the situation today. Now these are some basic ideas. Divine kingship, image of God, continuity between the old and the new. And yet, if I'm honest with you, I do have to say there have been multiple reformed theologies of the state throughout history. And the reason why that is, I believe, is that reformed theology, like the gospel itself, is applicable into many different situations. Go back to John Frame's definition of theology. It's applying scripture to situations in life. And there's a time, and I can look at Westminster, for instance, okay, which I'm an ordained Presbyterian pastor, and so I can look at Westminster coming out of 1646 and see how the, the Westminster divines, as we call them, which is somewhat ironic, I think as Reformed folks who have a very high view of divine sovereignty, and we call these humans divines. Okay, but in any case, um, the divines wrote, right, what did they write? They wrote that Parliament, the civil magistrate, has the power to call synods and councils of the church. Okay, now you won't be surprised, you, know, you Americans, that the 1788 version of the Westminster Confession that is adopted by the American Presbyterian Church doesn't include that. Right? It says, no, 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 it is up to the church to call it synods and councils. Now here, what do we see? We have two different bodies in two different situations applying scripture saying what's authorized, not merely what's prescribed, but what's authorized in this setting. I argue the same is true for John Calvin. Often John Calvin's involvement in the, uh, in the execution of Michael Servetus is highlighted as the fact that Reformed theologians can't support religious liberty. I'd say no, I, I would argue against that actually. Um, but I do think John Calvin was wrong on, his, on the merits of that case. Okay? And yet, what is he doing? He's saying, okay, what, uh, what is the power of the state in this context? What, what, what has the state been given? How do they rightly administer that? What are they authorized to do in this case? or not. With this brand, and I would argue that this is ex implicitly, not explicitly taught in scripture, but I think this grand innovation, I mean, I mean that uh, at sort of a historical level, the innovation of religious freedom, okay? I don't believe that it's a new thing, but its application as a political doctrine is relatively new. Um, I think that its application is prescribed in scripture, however it is somewhat implicit. You have to look, as we said, to the call for true faith. We have to look as uh, you know, the, the scriptures are, are regularly a witness against hypocritical belief, regularly witness against the idea of a compulsory faith. Notice even when Jesus in Mark 6 sends out his disciples, he says, when you go into a house and you proclaim the gospel and they reject it, what are you to do? Shake the dust off your feet. Recognize that it will be worse for those who have heard the gospel and rejected it than it is for those who haven't heard it. That's a it's, by the way, a very sober reminder for us. Okay? But when? It'll be in the final judgment. He doesn't say, now go, find Caesar, and you know, orchestrate a situation in which they have to accept the faith. Right? The, the assumption is that the Great Commission will be articulated through the proclamation of the gospel and the persuasion of the human heart. Okay? And so I think it's through doctrines like that that we see this implicit prescription for religious freedom of the type that Tom Farr was just describing. So that, that's just a bit of a case study in how we might apply scripture into different contexts in life. Let me end with this. In the 1646 edition of the Westminster Confession, the magistrates are called to, um, are given the, the authority to call citizens and councils. In the 1788 version, the state is merely described as a nursing father. Okay, it's an interesting, interesting turn of phrase. Nursing fathers who are caring for the church. Right? Okay? They're allowing for the context of the church to take, or they're allowing for a context in which the church can thrive. This is, this is like 1 Peter um, 2, where they're called to pray for the magistrate that the magistrate might maintain the peace and tranquility of society. Okay? This is again pushing back against chaos and death. And this gets at the core of the reform notion of the state. The idea that it's continuing the work that we are called to in the cultural mandate as those made in the image of God, deriving our authority from our divine authority, right? our King who is in heaven, Jesus Christ, on who, to whom has been given all authority.
Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Can you discuss how uh, theological arguments for religious freedom, as well as the arguments of the natural law as testifying to uh, the pre-political nature of religious freedom, do those ideas um, conflict with, in any way, the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament? Uh, and how might we uh, theologically assert religious freedom and utilize the natural law while maintaining integrity uh, of the scriptures? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And um, I, I would argue that you have to recognize, because first of all, there's, there's a certain specialness with the historical situation of Israel as well as the, um, the place of Israel in the Old Testament. So, so first of all, recognizing that something like the Kiram Ban is a very particular moment that is accomplishing a very particular thing. And all Christians do need to be reminded that this is, this is something that God closely has his hands on in the Old Testament. And this is a, uh, in, in a Reformed perspective, this would be a type, this would be establishing a pattern that is going to be fulfilled in the final judgment. And so um, we do need to recognize that religious freedom, while it has foundation in political discourse, there, there is this moment, we can even argue, C.S. Lewis does, that even in the final judgment, religious freedom is acknowledged. It's just that those who are apostate, those who are unbelieving, are given the just ends of what their religious freedom has led them to. You could argue something like that. But the other passages, like Jesus saying, you know, to those who say, didn't we cry out your name? And he says, I never knew you. It does indicate that it's a little more complicated than C.S. Lewis lays out in the great divorce. Um, sorry, for, the, for those who have read Lewis, uh, you, you have ears to hear. Um, <laughs> so, this is, when we look at Israel, I think we need to recognize that they are filling a space as the people of God, the covenantal people of God, advancing the redemptive historical program that's begun, I would even argue back in that. Like some people say, no, it's merely for all of humanity. I would say it is, he is, but there are also certain mandates, there's a redemptive aspect to know in that he's creating a theater in which Abraham can take place. Okay, so Abraham is now promised the land and the seed, and Moses is promised, and this is how the people of God will operate in the land where to receive those blessings. Okay, that's why I think I'm not surprised when Paul takes Israel and in those redemptive aspects of the Israelite nation applies them now to the church. So when I see Israel, for instance, punishing unbelief, I would say, and now this is fulfilled in the church punishing unbelief. Right? So we believe in religious freedom because we're talking about the level of the state. But then the level of the church, you know, I, I know that if I were to stand up here right now and reject you know, the deity of Christ, I have a presbytery that would come down on my shoulders right afterwards, right? Because they don't believe in religious freedom in the le at the level of the, of the church, okay? They, they call for a doctrinal um, subscription. So that's how we apply Israel in its religious historical context today, we apply it to the situation of the church. And yet I also point out, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 20, elsewhere, Moses is told how to interact with unbelieving nations. And it's not built on the principle of conversion. It's built on the principle of diplomacy, first and first and foremost. And I think actually the church would do well to look at those oracles against the nations that we find in the Old Testament prophets and note what it is that God is requiring of the unbelieving nations. And that, that would be, that's a fascinating study that you actually don't see many people focus on because nobody reads the prophets. But what is Babylon and Edom and, and Moab? What is required of them according to, uh, according to the Old Testament prophets? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that helps us understand what's required then of us uh, as we're approaching the issue of the state. And by the way, a Chinese Christian can also do the same thing. What would be required of the state? How about a Muslim living in, a convert living in, in Algeria? What's required of the state? What should they yearn for and push towards in their own application of scripture in their own context. Any other questions? Thank you for bearing with me on a, a biblical theological discussion for a moment. Uh, I, I benefit greatly, because it's not my field, but I benefit greatly from those uh, in, who are in the historical and in the more systematic theological space to fill in my, my biblical wanderings and research with how these have been applied in history. So while I say I disagree with Calvin, I still benefit greatly from seeing how Calvin applies it. As I look at the 1646 Confession, 
it's interesting to see how believers sitting down with the scripture applies it into their setting. It's like looking at case studies to help you think properly and rightly about what you do. So I'd encourage you not only to delve into your scriptures, but to delve into history as we have even this morning and look at how churches have applied the scripture through the illumination of the spirit into a different